What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Cinema Royale. We are your hosts. I'm John Nolan. I'm Travis Thompson. You look like you were, like you had just sat down in your chair. Yeah, right? I was just moving around. I was zipping my jacket up. And... <laughs> He's got to start early. What is he doing? I mean, Why some days, man. To do that? He's supposed to do that before. <laughs> see, I would be so much more comfortable doing these if I didn't have the, the replay screen in front of me so I could see how goofy I look all the time. So I'm like, mm, 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 yeah. can't help it. <laughs> What's going on, man? You were just, uh, everything going good? You were just telling me about a new yeah. game you found. I know it's the first five minutes is always Punch Drunk game, Gaming, so. No, right, and no, it's not supposed to be that. Uh, we are the Punch Drunk Critics. I'm Travis Hobson. That's John Nolan. We are film critics here. But, uh, yeah, we play games, too. Uh, yeah, I'm playing <laughs> Knockout City uh, right now. Of course, I'm still playing Overwatch and Mass Effect, too. But uh, Knockout City is my new joint, man. It is fun as hell. So it's just dodgeball? It's basically, it's basically just dodgeball, super super dodgeball. It's basically what it is. Mostly right. three, mostly three on three, uh, with a lot of customizable stuff, and uh, yeah, you can form little crews, little teams, right? With your boys, so you need to get in there so you can join. Yeah, uh, well, you know, the you laughed at me a second ago when I, I brought up River City Ransom, but um, those were so the dodgeball was made by the same people. I, I can't remember if it was Tecmo or Koei or. Right, well, they all had the same little, like, tiny stout characters with round heads. Yeah. And um, I remember River City Ransom was the first one I played, but pretty much any game they came out with with those little fellows, I loved. That well, studio those was games all point. connected. If you ever look at the Japanese versions of those games, they're all connected. Like, the characters are the same. Uh, they're like, It's like one big universe, like one big story. They were the originators um, of the like, shared universe. <laughs> yeah, there's, like... 12 13 or 14 games in that little franchise of games with river city ransom being just one wow that brought over here to america and they changed everything so it feels like it's this totally separate thing mm -hmm. i can't remember if it's connected to double dragon or not but i know it's close but um but yeah it's a whole huge thing man but yeah uh knockout city you remember the game jet grind radio yeah jet set radio yeah. jet Those set games? radio right yeah, it was Jet Set Radio. I think those Jet Grind Radio might have been a sequel or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's that. Think about that in terms of like stylistic. Mm -hmm. It's like that. Um, it's really cool, man. A lot of fun. It's simple as hell to learn and pick up and play too. So, you know, I'm, I've been I've been finishing Ghost yeah, of Tsushima. If you, want to, if you want to sponsor us, EA, uh, we'll be happy to 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 play some Knockout City on stream for you. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I've been playing Ghost of Tsushima, and I've been using that to keep me from dropping the 80 bucks for resident evil village so maybe i'll just have to go right to knockout city and uh and, and keep that 70 dollars purchase down for a few more days um yeah i, I it, you should have got it i think you should have got it like in the last day or two it's like it's been 10 percent off mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're planning for they had it for a free trial for like 10 days and i think oh. it just uh, i know but i think it might still be on game pass though so you might just you might just be able to play it there if you have Xbox Game Pass. Well, I'll be but, checking uh, that out as soon as we're done here. But it's it's total cross play too. So if you had it on Switch or PC, you could still play with me on Xbox. Oh uh, no. See, yeah. I don't understand why everything is not like that at this point. It seems stupid for it not to be, but Yeah. Difficulty. Yeah. Because you get situations mm -hmm. like I bought Overwatch for my Switch and you bought it for Xbox, so we can't play. I have to buy another copy of Overwatch so we can play because there's no cross play on that. No, that sucks. Yeah. Um, you know, I was actually really excited to get in here today because for the first time in a year and a half almost, we have like an actual legit normal sounding box office total for, you know, for opening actually, weekend. I started the box office a little bit before the show started. And I haven't finished it yet. But one of the things I wrote in there in the beginning was for the first time in forever, we have two major studio movies competing against one another like we haven't had any mm -hmm. and of course those two movies are cruella and and a quiet place too which it feels like we've been waiting an eternity for that one yeah um, i said a few moments ago i was like I'll, I'll feel like things are back to normal when i'm sitting in a theater watching a quiet place too mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it thinks and you know what almost all of my friends who have not gone to i'm seeing like i've seen three at least three people on my facebook page say I haven't been to the movies in over a year. I'm sitting here at a quiet place too. Yep. Um, I've seen at least three people say that today. So uh, people are coming back and they're coming back for this movie. And yeah, it's box office, which uh, over the four day Memorial Day weekend is close to $60 million. 
is about as close to normal as, as we've seen in a very long time. And for something like A Quiet Place 2, granted, as big of a hit as the first one was, it probably would have pulled $100 million if there never was a COVID, but... Sixty million for a movie this budget is is a respectable box office. So I, I know there's a lot of studio heads, a lot of theater owners, that are seeing this as as like you know, the the sign of good things to come. Um, yeah. And sixty million dollars for a movie that's going to be on Paramount Plus in forty five days. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. I yeah, still wanted to come out. Do you have Paramount Plus yet? Uh, I don't think so. I, I can't find a reason to get it. Infinite's going to be my reason, I think. But I have almost all of the other streaming love services. You for saying that. What's they that? I not love you for saying that. Well, I mean, I, I got to be honest. Watching, I mean, <laughs> uh, other than the fact that it seems like a blatant Highlander ripoff um, at first, it, it it's just it's so totally did my the thing. The old guard, the old guard looked like Highlander too. Yeah, except for in the old guard, they didn't bring out a katana in the in the beginning and do everything other than call him Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod. But yes, yeah. I mean, the, the old similar. guard was nothing but swords and shit. I mean, it was. <laughs> Am I not remembering the old guard, right? The old guard, the old guard had had guns and swords. He had all sorts of stuff. It was just Highlander. But I gotta it's watch it again. Fine. It was fine. It was still good. I mean, it was. Oh still, yeah, yeah. It still, you know, separates itself from Highlander enough. Yeah. But the general premise of it was on was pretty much Highlander. <laughs> Which have we talked about? And I know we usually do the news in the second half, but I don't think we've talked about the Highlander remake that's coming out. And who is it? Who who are they tapping to? Oh, damn it. It was on the tip of my tongue. Oh, Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill. That's right. Um, Henry Cavill um, is set to star in Lion Gate reboot of Highlander. Yeah. What, what, I don't think we've talked about on there. I, I'm curious to know. Well, we, we would have done it last show if we had uh, if we had done the last week's show. We were right. Right there. But yeah, Henry Cavill, Highlander, uh, Chad, I think it's Chad Stahelski directing it, you know, the John Wick guy. Do uh, you think in 2021 that they cast a white Scotsman as a Spanish Egyptian? No. Of course, I'm talking about Juan Dilo Villalobos de la... Sean Connery playing playing an Egyptian that is hiding out as a Spaniard. Um, one of the best things about that movie. But also... Putting Henry Cavill in there, I mean, he is about as close as you get to the archetype for 80s action star that we have working right now. But you're putting him in a movie that the antithesis of that was the star. Christopher Lambert was as far from Schwarzenegger as you get. I mean, he seemed more like your weird uncle than he did, you know, the guy that was going to save the planet. Yeah, but I mean, but the Highlander movies weren't a typical action movie either. No. They were completely different. Um, I don't know. I, I'm interested in this Highlander reboot, but to be honest, it's been... Remember, this used to be a Ryan Reynolds project. Oh, yeah, it's bounced it's, through everybody, but... It was among the many things back when Ryan Reynolds was red hot, and I used to make fun of him for having too many things going on. This mm-hmm. episode, and um, being super popular, and then half that stuff, and then all that stuff died like within a year. Yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> and then, like this, Re- this Green Lantern were- bombed, this movie went away. Yeah. Uh, Wolverine Weapon X just destroyed everything. So a whole bunch of stuff just like destroyed everything for right yeah, now yeah. In one big swoop. Um, and of course, obviously he came back, but um, but uh, this is one of his per, uh, projects from at least a decade ago. This thing's been on the burner yeah. for. A while. I mean, it's it's so prime for always being remade, and I mean, this series had so much juice. I mean. And for those that don't remember, I mean, obviously there's movies, but there was also a very successful or, you know, somewhat successful I watch that TV show. series throughout the 90s with um, Lorenzo Lamas, right? No, it wasn't Lorenzo Lamas. It was... Um, he wasn't in Highlander? No, that's not... It was Adrian Paul. Oh. It was Adrian Paul that was in the Highlander TV show. Okay. they. I think they looked the same, maybe. I can see a little bit of the resemblance there, but yeah, it was Adrian Paul. I used to watch. I think I've seen every episode of that show, actually. Yeah, that that was the, the kind of show that you'd see on a Saturday afternoon, sandwiched between Xena and Hercules, and then followed by the new Outer Limits show that was on. <laughs> that was like a Saturday afternoon on uh, on standard TV. It but, came on at random times. I can never figure out when Highlander was going to be on exactly, and I'm pretty sure they showed most of those episodes out of order. Because everything yeah. was all mixed up. You know, but, the stuff, the syndicated stuff back in the '90s, the syndicated stuff didn't seem like it ever had a schedule. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like every Tuesday at 10 a.m. you could see Highlander. It was always well, just. 
for me, like for me, it was it was like Saturday, like around between like one and four in the afternoon. Exactly. Yep. You'd get, you'd get like uh, Andromeda. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> That's another one. I haven't thought that. But Babylon Five was another one. And and, and maybe Mutant X mm-hmm. or something like that. You know, you get this weird block of like mostly Canadian TV shows. Like all these shows were like Canadian, like made in Canada, stuff like that. The most of them aren't even made here. Oh, is that uh, what it was? Is that what, was that the <laughs> distinguishing characteristic? I never. Yeah, was all these shows. You know, remember how they all look the same? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mostly oh, yeah. Shows are, mostly shows were Canadian, and then I think they are probably made from like the same same studio company, production companies, and stuff. So yeah, I couldn't. That's I couldn't. why they're always blocked together. They probably had to buy them in a block. If I'm, if I'm perfectly honest, if I'm mm-hmm. thinking about it, they probably had to buy most of these shows in a block. So. And nowadays, almost all TV is made in Canada, so <laughs> they've uh, they've come a long way. Um, yeah, but before I got us on that very weird detour, we were talking about Quiet Place Part Two. <laughs> All right, let's let's actually talk about the movies we're supposed to be talking about here. We yeah, really spend enough time talking about right? first video games and then uh, Highlander. Um, not even Highlander movies. Spent more time talking about the Highlander TV show. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right with me. It's, it's all right. So let's talk about A Quiet Place too, because this is one of people I think people are most excited about. Like I said, it did it really well at the box office this week. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, so yeah, you usually get a big weekend. Um, John Krasinski's back to direct it. Uh, this one picks up right where the last one left off. The family is still reeling from the, uh, the, uh, his, his his character's death. Um, I don't know. I feel I feel some kind of way about this. And I'm still trying to figure it out in my head, sort of. Uh, because I know a lot of people love it, and that's great. Mm-hmm. I liked it. I, I enjoyed it. But it also... And I wrote this in my review. It feel it felt like a franchise sequel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and look, the first one was it was a big surprise to everyone. It came out of nowhere. Um, I think one of the best things about it was that it, it felt like it was this one and done story, and this family that survives this traumatic thing with these creatures that that track you by sound. Really great stuff. It was artsy enough. I think it was artistic enough. Uh, while feeling also like something of a blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got the blockbuster part in the sequel. I got felt that. Um, it's not as, I don't think it's quite as creative and it scares. I think there's a lot more jump scares in it, mm-hmm. uh, which means like that, that delicious tension that we got in the first movie wasn't always there. Um, I, I felt a little bit shortchanged in that this time. But at the same time, I really give a shit about the Abbott clan. Like yeah. the people, like the family. Like I give a shit about whether or not they survive and what their story is going forward. I like the fact that this movie broadens its horizon. So this movie basically isn't about as much Emily Blunt's character. It's about the kids. And it's about kind of them leaving the nest in a way. Like, like parents have to endure their kids leaving the nest. These kids leave the nest. Uh, the daughter, played by Melissa Simmons, who's actually a deaf actress, uh, her character ventures out on her own when she figures out that there may be more people out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, they encounter uh, Killian Murphy's character, uh, who's, who's uh, I won't give everything away by him, they encounter him, who kind of takes them in, in a sense. But he's like the polar opposite to John Krasinski's hopeful character. Uh, he he feels the complete opposite. Nobody's worth saving, and it's basically about these kids, um, kind of going against that attitude, mm-hmm. and uh, and looking to change the world in their own way. It's about a, kind of a passing of the torch, and I like that aspect of the story. Uh, and there's one thing that this franchise, through two movies, I think that they that they has this has become sort of this franchise's thing. Um. It's splitting the Abbots up and then having them all go through something insanely crazy, like all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like everybody has like a thing that happens while they're separated. Yeah. <laughs> like their so, own like, their own trial that they, they right. must pass if but they want they to see all, each other again. Mm-hmm. Right, but it always happens at the exact same time. So there's this like maybe 10, 15 minute sequence where it's just insane the amount of stuff that's going on 
and you're just trying to you're trying to keep your heart rate down while you're watching all this stuff happen all at once. Yeah, and, and, and this movie does that extremely well too, just like the first one did. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, this one I enjoyed. I just didn't quite enjoy it as much as the first one. Yeah, I think I think I think it's gonna be hard to enjoy it as much as the first one, just because a movie like this, or at least the first one, you know, it excelled so much on the strength of its um, concept. You know, it, the whole idea of, of you know, these having to be totally quiet or you're going to get eaten, and, and not just that, but the, the lengths they went to. I mean, Quiet Place Part 1, one thing you never expect to see in a horror movie is a kid getting killed. And then as soon as they do that, it's just like Hereditary did the same thing. As soon as they do that, it's like at, all bets are off. Like, literally, it takes everything out, and you're up in this place that you're not expecting and, and you're, you're on another level waiting for what else is going to happen. Coupled with Krasinski's surprising skill with directing suspense um, made Quiet Place 1 something that was so amazing. Quiet Place 2 at least stays on par with that. I don't think you can ever be as good as it, good of it because as good as it, the original, because you already know what to expect. And part of the biggest impact of the first was not knowing what what you were expecting right um, and plus he, he did such things with sound in that first one i don't yeah. think he does quite as much in this one except maybe in that opening opening flashback sequence mm -hmm. he does it really well where he plays around with sound and the lack of it well um, yeah and it's it's the opening of the of the world um leaves and i think that's if i was going to go anywhere i would think that maybe not going into this whole new universe of people, you know, bring in one or two more people, yeah, but bringing in all those people because you, you kind of lose your laser focus, which allows you to focus on little things like that, like the impact of having to be quiet all the time, little stuff, like your stomach gurgling could kill you. Um, but that being said, I think I think with all that out there, it, it does exactly what you want it to do. Uh, I think, you know, the, the tension and... It's, it's like you're waiting for a jump scare the entire time that never comes. Um, and there are scares throughout, don't get me wrong, but it's like that, that level of tension, is that, that's what that feels like. Um, like you're waiting to sneeze and you can't sneeze from start to end of this film. And I think that's, that's what hits me so hard about A Quiet Place. I think... Hold on a second. Stay away, Chuck. Uh, hold on. <laughs> no. 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 Chuck is a cat, everybody, just so we're He's clear. <laughs> who's, trying to get, who's trying to go in my closet? Um, ah. um, this is about as perfect of a return to theaters movie as you could get, though. Okay, the, the oh, best thing yeah. that, that the that uh, that the thing that I remember most about the first A Quiet Place because we saw it in the screening mm -hmm. was being there in that in that theater with a, a full crowd of people and everybody being afraid to make a sound themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that was the best thing about it. And you're talking about the, for most people, like um, for most people, this being the first movie that they're going to see in theaters in over a year, you want that experience. You want that experience of being next to somebody who's who's uh, terrified into silence. You want that. You want that group feeling. And uh, this is great for that. Uh, and people are going to love that. This movie, this movie's got an, an A, an A minus cinema score already. So people who've seen it already love it. Um, well, I got an A, so people like that too. But, yeah, I, but um, I, I think you really hit on something there. And I don't know if they're smart enough in Hollywood to have planned this, but if you are going to entice people back to theaters, you're absolutely right. A movie like this is what's going to bring people back. Is 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 it's what's going to remind them of because you go see a romantic comedy at theater, you're not going to you're going to remember the floors are sticky, the high price. You might not remember why you love theaters, but you go to see something like A Quiet Place and you have that... Think about the floor being sticky. Is that what you think about when you're in a movie? No, I'm saying if I go to see like a boring romantic comedy, I'm like, oh man, you know, but it's, it, the experience isn't overtaking my emotions is what I'm saying. Um, you're thinking about the fun you're having and you're having that because you're, you're watching in a group setting. I think this this is... Um, I, I mean, I, obviously I liked it quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, like I, said, I liked it too. I, I just don't... I mean, it's it's hard for it to hit the same way as the first one did. It was it's just really tough. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus, we've seen kind of the 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 whole thing with sound been has been done a little bit more. Like when Sound of Metal kind of did the same thing in a lot of ways too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not as unique as as it was as the first one was for obvious reasons. 
But uh, I think the big difference is that John Krasinski wrote this script by himself, whereas mm-hmm. he had, he was one third of a, of a of a trio that wrote the script for the first script. Um, so I, and he's I mean I, I don't know I I don't want to knock him as a writer I don't think he's a bad writer. Um, this this script is is fine. It's just, I don't think it's quite as good as the first one was. But it's it's still a good movie. I wouldn't mind going to see it again in a theater with some friends. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, might feel a little even better. Might feel a bit better about it the next time I see it. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but it's doing well in box office. I'm happy about that. Anything that gets things semi back to normal, I'm okay with. And now that theaters are um, loosening the mask mandates, mm-hmm. uh, making it so that uh, anybody who is vaccinated doesn't need to wear a mask. I don't know how the hell they're going to check all that. Um, more people I know will be going uh, mm-hmm. to the movies. I think that, that might be a big reason why people did go to the movies because those mandates are down. It could be. I, I don't know about you. I, I'm fully vaccinated, and I I still don't want to take my mask off in public. Not because I'm worried about getting sick, but just because I, I feel like I'm taking my pants down nowadays if I take my mask off in public. You're going to bring my mask uh, yeah. with me. If I'm sitting next to a friend, mm-hmm. I probably won't wear it. If I'm sitting in a group of people and there's people I don't know around me, I'll probably still wear it. Um, I mean, that's just how I'm going to roll. It's just, it seems like yeah, a social taboo now. Imagine, because I imagine most of those people who are suddenly deciding to come back Probably didn't get vaccinated. No, uh, no not. <laughs> the funniest joke I saw was I'm vaccinated, but I'm gonna keep wearing my mask so people don't think I'm a Republican. <laughs> that's the irony. That too, but that, yeah. that's the irony is that most of the people who've been complaining about the about the mask mandates are the people who won't get vaccinated. <laughs> right, 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 right. Because the rest of us know how to do things for the greater good, and we just do them. I, but I have a friend who's like that. She wanted to come with us to see a movie. She's like, but it, but are they still having the mask mandates? So you can't. You have to wear a mask if you go. It's like. Yeah, so she didn't come. So she won't show up. She won't go to the movies. I guarantee you, she'll go to the movies now. But yeah, she, she didn't get vaccinated. She I mean, won't. those those people—not <laughs> your friend, but those people in general—are pretty cruel to humanity. And you know who else is cruel to humanity? Who's crueler than Cruella? Let's be honest. Hold on that one. Wonderful okay. segue. Um, I, I'm just—I'll—I'll I'll sum up my thoughts here in just one one quick. Thing. I mean, obviously, this is the origin, the secret origins of Cruella de Vil, she of 101 Dalmatians fame. I wish they would stop saying that. This character has no connection to Cruella de Vil whatsoever. It's intent, well, yeah, but it's intended for the same, like, that That was their intent, no? Well, I know it's their, their intent, but... Well, and here's the that, problem. That, that character, this character in Cruella can never possibly grow up to be the character in one No, one. no, no. Because this is, this is, they've taken one of the best villains in Disney history, one of the most memorable villains in Disney history, and they did the same thing Rob Zombie did to Michael Myers. They did the same thing that so many people have done to big-time villains. You give them an origin story. Mystery is what is terrifying. Mystery is interesting. It's not interesting if I know exactly why, especially when you make me feel bad for hating a woman that was basically just a trauma case growing up through all the stuff she had to be through. I mean, this movie was gorgeous. I'll give it that. It's very stylish, very cool looking. And, you know, Emma Stone and Emma Thompson, you can't really ever go wrong with them fully, but I don't think the story needed to be told. No, of course not. The Maleficent story didn't need to be told. Yeah, but, but that was enjoyable. At least, at least with Maleficent, I can see the threads that made the character that we know. I right. Can see um, I not I, I don't I don't like everything about those movies. Uh, in fact, I don't like much about the sequel at all. Mm-hmm. But I can see how the person in those movies becomes the Maleficent that we know from Sleeping Beauty. I can see that. Yeah. I, there's no. This is just. This is just. This is a completely different character. This is world. Devil Wears Prada covered in oh, yeah, Cruella. Devil Wears Prada um, in 1960s uh, swinging London, which is fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, I love that era of fashion. It's a, an amazing time. You've got punk, a punk rock scene. You've got the mods and the, and the and you know, all those folks. Style. It, I mean, it's it's a fun movie, man. The soundtrack is, I think, one of the best Disney's ever put together. This mm. soundtrack is amazing. It's a little overloaded. There's like 40 tracks in there, and you're always like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of fucking tracks in this movie. There's too many. But the ones that they choose are really great. Uh, so yeah, stylistically, production design, costumes, fantastic. 
Um, I even like Emma Stone as as um, Cruella. She, she um, can rock. For somebody that's always been famous as a redhead, a gorgeous redhead at that, she can really rock the whole black and white, straight down the middle look. Is there any look that she can't rock? Honestly? Absolutely not. But you I know, mean, she's had a kid now, so she probably can't rock anything anymore. But that's okay. What's on there? <laughs> you call me bad. <laughs> <laughs> had a kid now. Oh man. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, <laughs> but. I mean, this this Cruella, um, this Cruella who who loves animals and loves dogs and yeah, and, uh, I mean, it's just like I mean, come on, I, I don't understand this, and, and it kind it's kind of like it's not quite the same, it's not exactly the same, but it reminded me of the movie Hannibal, which is like we wanted to root for Hannibal Lecter because everybody else that he was going after was so much worse, mm-hmm. and it's kind of like this. Emma Thompson's character, the Baron, is 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 pretty awful. But uh, she's the one that I actually thought should be Cruella. <laughs> yeah. Like, I was like, if you told me, like, the movie should have ended with the Baroness being the one who became Cruella. Like, Killing Emma Stone and taking over her identity. Over her identity. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what I wanted. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I wanted, but halfway through, I was like, she should be Cruella because she actually seems like she could be. Uh, whereas yeah. I wasn't getting that vibe from Cruella, and they were doing everything in their power to make her not just sympathetic, but antithetical to who Cruella was. Yeah, not even yeah, anti-hero. They were, they were, like. They were their nose at you about it, too, because there were a couple times where she was like, well, at least one time she was like, um, these these dogs will make a great coat. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, is this the moment where she's going to turn? But, I mean, that's not what they did. Instead, they made her do the complete opposite. And you're like, I don't know who this person is. This isn't Cruella. This doesn't make any sense to me. And yeah. then, of course, it ends explicitly in a way where it absolutely can't be her. <laughs> which which has a pretty direct line to 101 Dalmatians. But it's like, it can't be her. Like, it, they just not, it's just not the same. Yeah, but so, I, I, even if, yeah. even if it was logical and it felt earned, it's still kind of a bait and switch. That's what we want to see. But then again, I don't really know who wanted to see that. I think... Disney especially, but pretty much anybody that makes, you know, the villains are always super interesting and they're always somewhat mysterious. So we always want to fill more celluloid telling what what's mysterious about them. But that ruins the point, number one. But number two, when they make these movies, they never have the balls, with the only exception being Joker. They never have the balls to actually make the villain a villain. You know, they're not just explaining it. They're explaining it so that you side with them because they're like, well... If they're the protagonist, they have to be the hero too, right? It's Disney, and Disney is Disneyfying these characters because Disney is 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 franchise forward. Franchise Disney is franchise thinking, right? At all times, and they're seeing Cruella franchises, mm-hmm. um, which is the entire point of this movie. You're not going to make a Cruella franchise out of a villain uh, because they because to, to their mind, people don't want to pay to see a villain, um, so you have to turn that person into a hero, um, right? Maleficent, I think they walked the balance just just well enough. Um, they were able to pull it off. She still comes across like a villain to me. Yeah. Um, I can see her as a villain still, but I can also see why somebody might look at her as anti-hero type. Well, and Male- uh, Maleficent also had the benefit of being more steeped in fairy tale. So, um, you know, even when they were telling the story, it still seemed... Like a Disney movie, I guess. If, however, that makes sense. It, like it's, it seemed like a fairy tale, even though they were changing things. It had the benefit of magic and things around it like that, whereas this didn't. So, right, yeah. So, um, Cruella, yeah, it's I mean, definitely it's not a, a thirty dollar premiere Cruella access buy. I'll tell you that. It's made uh twenty six point five million is the estimate for the for this weekend for Cruella. Uh, it's also available on Disney Plus premiere access. Now that's that's a, a neat little point there. You mentioned Quiet Place Part Two, Paramount Plus in a month made sixty million dollars. Cruella, which has is available right now on Disney Premier Access, only made twenty four million. Generally speaking, you'd think Cruella would make more than a Quiet Place. Do you think that's a, do you think it's the time and date thing? Do you think people can't wait another forty five days for Paramount Plus, so they're going to go right now? I think there's a couple things. I don't think Cruella would have beaten A Quiet Place 2 in a straight head-to-head. Okay. Quiet Place 2 is a is an established franchise. Established franchise that people have been 
that people uh, love, obviously. Mm-hmm. Cruella is, even though it's Disney and it's Emma Stone and it's a character we know, um, not all of these, you know, fairy tale remakes and reimaginings, not all of them have been gigantic, huge, you know, openings. Not all of them. I think Cruella probably would have fallen towards the mid range of those. So I think it probably would have lost to a quiet place too anyway. Mm-hmm. It obviously would have done better at the box office than twenty six million dollars. But um we don't know how it did in terms of premier access. Disney's done really well with those over the last last year. So I'm sure have they been as sneaky with their numbers as say Amazon usually is or Netflix yeah, usually is? Yeah they haven't released the numbers for this one yet uh for premier access but they will release those numbers if they're good. <laughs> yeah. They're good they release those numbers. It's the same way Netflix does. Netflix releases the numbers when they're good. They don't release numbers that suck. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that makes sense. But, I mean, it's just, I mean, I guess I get it. Obviously, why would you want to, you know, put out your failures? But, you know, it just always seemed weird to me that, you know, we obviously know box office right off the break. But, um, you know, anything streaming, they, they're hiding from us. Although I should always say that uh, it's studios that release those numbers from the box office too, so. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but uh, which is why the weekend is always estimates and then usually get actuals Monday or Tuesday. So, mm-hmm. But most of us just follow the week. And they usually tend to be pretty close, so it's it's not a big of a deal. Right. Uh, so I would, look, I would say, I would recommend both these movies ultimately. I would even recommend Cruella. Mm-hmm. I just... I just don't. I just, I, I wish they could have just made it something else. Like, it didn't have to be Cruella. I mean, that's kind of the thing I always land on when it comes to some of this stuff. We're well, yeah, I mean, that's all too often that that happens. Like, if you're going to take something in name only, then just make it its own thing. And then you'll it'll be a good thing that people like, usually, and you'll get the, the props for releasing something that's original. Yeah, I, you know? I agree. Then again, people don't pay for original. I mean, true yeah. enough. You know, you can't you can't really fault them if if I say uh, again I say that and a quiet place too was original. A quiet place was original. I mean, so it it really just it's 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 hard it's hard to get something to launch. Yeah, something. I mean, a quiet place was original, backed by Emily Blunt and John Krasinski were were real heavy on the headlines, and then but that's also that well, that one was a, a one in one in a hundred shot. Most movies aren't that great that are original, but. Um, you know, there are quite a few that are worthy of watching and fun enough. You know, they're not all having to be blockbusters. It was also a smaller budgeted horror movie, like yeah, a lot of them tend to be. So, right. Mm. All right, those are so, our reviews for the week. Uh, there are other reviews you can find on the site right now. We've got mm-hmm. a bunch of them actually. I did Endangered Species with uh, Rebecca Romaine and Jerry O'Connell. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, so that. <laughs> Wow. That is that movie is up. That review is up there, as well as my interview with the director of that film, M.J. Barrett. That was a great interview as well, um, and a whole bunch of other reviews. Blue Miracle, which is the Netflix film with Dennis Quaid. Um, yeah, a lot of reviews are up this week, so go ahead and check them out at punchdrunkcritics.com right now. Just click on the reviews tab, and you will see them all. Yeah, you can you can look at the reviews while you listen to our show or watch our show. You, two things at once, people. Multitasking. It's the way of the future. Um, you know, we, we just talked about streaming places and how they let, uh, how they're, they're hesitant to let their numbers out. Well, um, the, the total global takeover of Amazon is one step closer with their acquisition of Metro Goldwyn Meyer, MGM studios, uh, a, a namesake and, and a, a pillar of Hollywood for so long. Everybody knows the lion. Now the lion belongs to Amazon. Now that his. line is Jeff Bezos. Yeah, Jeff Bezos. It's going to be it's going to be him in the in the opening thing now. In the opening <laughs> He's opening. like, rawr. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He's gonna get <laughs> that, if I was him, you know he's got fuck you money. So if he wanted to do that, he should just go ahead and do it. <laughs> let's not let's not go down that route again because it always ends the same way with me. It'll always end with me saying, "All you assholes have billions of dollars that you don't help people with, and you don't even bother to become Batman." Uh, Jeff Bezos is particularly bad about that. But that's anyway. that's the most unforgivable thing. You're not even being a superhero, and you could be. 
Um, anyway, so Amazon's uh, owning MGM. Everybody's first thoughts obviously goes to the Bond franchise, but what else is is? And, but Bond isn't really doesn't really come with MGM. They're just distributors. Yeah, I mean the Broccoli's own those. Hey, Barbara Broccoli and, and uh, Michael Wilson are the um, are the producers and creative and creative force behind the Bond franchise. Mm-hmm. MGM is a distributor, but um, but obviously it this does this does have an impact on Bond. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, Bond's going to go streaming now. Eh, probably not. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, the producers actually said, no, we're committed to the theatrical experience. Bond's not going to streaming. But um, but would you be at all surprised if they do something similar to what Paramount's doing or what HBO Max is doing, maybe having a day and date release? Absolutely or a, not. Or a shortened theatrical window of 45 or 60 days? No, in fact, I think that's likely to happen, and then they'll go, and then it'll move exclusive to. to I think that's likely to be the standard in the next couple years. We know we won't lose theaters, but we'll get that. The other thing I would think of is, you know, Amazon's almost kind of primed themselves for this already with the Jack Ryan show, uh, starring the aforementioned John Krasinski. I, I mean, I can see them maybe not Bond, but I could see them having a spinoff called M or a spinoff called Money Penny. Um, where they they follow uh, you know other characters in there, and oh, if they yeah. went with the money penny that was in the the Daniel Craig version, I'd be okay with that. It just sounds fucking awful. Yeah, it does. Um, I don't. But want you know it'll happen. <laughs> I don't want anything like that. Um, you know it will. Uh, um, they also have the, the the deal also comes with the the Rocky and the Creed franchises. Mm-hmm. So you got that as well. And right, Stallone's been talking about a Rocky series. That he's been trying to make. Um, there you go. Might, I would not be surprised if we see something soon about uh, a Rocky series coming to Amazon. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This is a big deal, obviously. It's another major story for a story uh, studio that has gone the, gone the way of, uh, well, it's been acquired by another studio, similar to yeah. what happened to Fox and Disney. It's just been sucked up into the machine. And it's getting harder and harder for these things, for these studios to kind of exist on their own. It's just, I mean, we, we see it happen, and we know it's happening that all this power and all this IP is being consolidated, and there's not really anything we can do about it, obviously, but at the same time, I feel like it should be a bigger a bigger red flag for everybody as, as all this stuff is, is geared up just to make some, you know, multi-trillion dollar um, battle of the studios. But I think the most beautiful thing about all this stuff that I remember is that no matter what, you'll always have places like Blumhouse that'll be able to come in there and make their movie for a million dollars and kick the rest of the, the movies that these people bring up out of the, the box office. But um, They'll get bought by somebody soon, don't worry. Blumhouse is too much integrity to do that. I do not believe you, sir. Um, but the only the only thing I'm excited about is I would like to see a Rocky series, but not, not centered on Rocky, obviously. I, I'd like to see a, a sitcom based around... Paulie and his robot girlfriend. You don't want, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want uh, the young Rocky Chronicles. You don't want. Hey, yo, I'm gonna suck at boxing for the next twenty years, and then you know, maybe I'll fight. Series, this series sounds terrible too, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw it. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rocky. like Small Wonder, except for it's it's Paulie and that robot from Part Four. That's Rocky, that's all it is. Rocky the young boxer, maybe. You know, yeah, Rocky fighting his fighting his way up the up the the. That would be the definition of why prequels shouldn't be made. Like, we know what happened with Rocky when he was younger. He was a jobber. He did okay. He lost out. a lot. That's we're it. We're going to find out that he met Apollo Creed at a young age. Like, they were they were friends long ago. They've been friends since they were, like, 12. Was it, like, Smallville? <laughs> yeah. It, well, you, you joke, but you know exactly this is what a young Rocky show would do. Yeah. They would introduce a young Apollo Creed. Or at a they, minimum, they'd show Rocky looking up to him and be like, one day I'll be like the champ, you know? They, they, would, they would introduce a young Clubber Lang, or they would do stuff like that. I mean, you think I'm joking, but that's exactly what they would do. I, just, I don't think you're joking. I'm just laughing at the ridiculousness of how true it is. It's ridiculous. It's stupid, but it's exactly what they would do, because that's what all these shows do, because mm-hmm. what good is a, sh- uh, is a show? And you can look at any iconic character that's had a young version of that, of that character, even like Gotham. Like, mm-hmm. I used Gotham as the example recently, where this where you have literally child aged Bruce Wayne, mm-hmm. and yet all of the characters that he ever ran into as adults are all 
still there. Like yeah. they're all just they're all young versions of. They're all there. It makes just, it it makes Batman that people. that much less impressive because he's just been fighting senior citizens this whole time. We didn't know there <laughs> before he's ever even Batman. Like yeah. he's just a kid. And the, all these same the fucking Catwoman is there. Cat or she's Cat Girl, I guess mm-hmm. in that show she was. Riddler was there. Penguin was there. Mm-hmm. They're all still there as part of his existence. Yep. Before he's ever Batman. And you know, and it doesn't matter what character you do that with, that's what they would do because that's what they think fans would would even expect. at their best, they can only hold off from touching the source IP for so long. Like in Gotham, the first season of Gotham was very good. Like they had Bruce Wayne, yeah, but he was just a school kid. He popped in every once in that while. But then as it goes on, it's like they can't resist the temptation and then they put him in and by the end he's Batman already. Well, I mean yeah. I remember when the first show first started, the creators are like well, our goal, our dream would be like to have him become Batman in the final episode, which is basically, it's basically what they did. I mean, yeah. he became Batman. You actually see him in the suit in the final episode. Yeah. He uh, was so just. They, so they actually 14. held true to that and they did it. Um, it. It's also one of the reasons why I didn't, I, I didn't keep watching it. I thought that was a terrible idea and I didn't want to see that. Yeah. Um, so I quit watching it during like season two. I mean, the thing is, <laughs> Gotham PD is such a good idea. And it's such a good comic arc. Like, there's, there's, if you haven't read Gotham PD at all, read it. And it's so good, and it doesn't involve Batman. And it's yeah. there. It's the, the scripts are written. And they just don't do it. But well, um, I mean, they're, they're doing the Gotham, the Gotham Central show with from on HBO. Yeah, but that's that. Apparently, it's not going to be like Gotham PD, like the the book. Um, speaking of comic book show. stuff, oops, what I do? Um, speaking of comic book stuff, we have our first. Is it the first? The first time. Uh, somebody's played two characters in Marvel with Aaron Taylor Johnson playing Quicksilver and now announced as Craven the Hunter? Well, I mean, when I wrote about this, I compared it to Evan Peters coming back and, in WandaVision because the situations are fairly similar. Right. First of all, they're both Quicksilver, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joe Johnson played Quicksilver in Marvel Marvel Studios Age Age of Ultron. Now he's coming back to Marvel, but it's not Marvel Studios; it's Sony Marvel. Yeah, and it's and he's playing Craven the Hunter, another Marvel character. Uh, it was almost the reverse for Evan Peters, uh, who who played Quicksilver for Fox, mm-hmm. and then came over to the Marvel Studios universe, the MCU to play a character that we thought was Quicksilver, but wasn't really. So, um, so yeah, he's coming back to Marvel, but not Marvel Studios. So, yeah. I want to uh, see I, the guidebook for this stuff that says, like, all right, Spider-Man is obviously part of the MCU, but the rest of his solo movie stuff aren't, or are, can we assume that they are? Like, is J. Jonah Jameson the same in Iron Man or Captain America that he was in that one? Right. Um, we, need, we need a guidebook for this kind of stuff. Do we? Do no. we? I don't think we do. No, not really. But, it's just, but then again, uh, I think all this stuff is about to start getting mingled anyway because Spider-Man No Way Home is bringing in characters from Sam Raimi and... Allegedly. Well, I guess some of them are confirmed. That's right. I mean, yeah, some of them are confirmed. Jamie Foxx is confirmed. Alfred yeah. Lee. Why, why won't they just confirm the other Spider-Man? That's what I don't get. Like, it's not a surprise anymore. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't... I'm not certain if they're, that they're actually in it. I don't know. I, I'm not convinced that they're in it. If they are, and they manage not to spoil that in a trailer, because, I mean, no better way to get everybody in the theater than to close the trailer with a shot of them saying, hey, Peter, hey, Peter, hey, Peter, and the three of those guys come together. The Sony and Marvel Studios universes are clearly connected. I mean, we saw Michael Keaton in the Morbius trailer. Mm-hmm. Um, I, we assume he's playing the same character he played um, before. Right. Right? So... Mm-hmm. Which is what the vulture? He played the vulture. In- yeah, yeah, he played the vulture in the first Spider Man. Yeah, so we assume he's playing that character again. Because mm-hmm. um, otherwise, why else? Why is he there? Um, so yeah, so they're clearly connected. Um, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so Craven the Hunter is what is what Aaron Taylor Johnson is playing in the in the Craven movie. Uh, yeah. this, obviously, because it's gonna have they're going to do is something similar with him that they've done with Venom, which is make him the uh, the anti hero version of Kraven. Uh, he is one of Spider-Man's most iconic villains. A uh, big game hunter who uh, basically at one point defeats Spider-Man pretty straight up. 
Yeah. And you see above us here, you have, um, uh, it's not an official shot. It's an artist rendition done by a, game, uh, a guy named Boss Logic. So credit to him for that. But he looks very much, I would have always assumed somebody like Jason Momoa for Craven the Hunter. But it, number one, Aaron Taylor Johnson is kick-ass no more. I mean, he's he, he doesn't look like a kid anymore. He's a grown-ass man. And he's a big guy, too. Um, and you throw him in a the beard really with that hair. Kid. Look really big in Tenet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Tenet looked really big. I mean, even, well, hell, even in Kick-Ass 2, the guy was jacked. But he's, I always think of him as like a early 20s type. But Craven the Hunter seems like a, you know, a man's man. And he, he fills that role now. So, yeah, um, nice. so that movie is going to be directed by J.C. Chander. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite directors did uh, Most Violent Year, All Is Lost. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, really great filmmaker. Margin Call. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I think it comes out in 2023 or something like that, maybe. Sticking uh, with Marvel, um, Okoye is getting her own spinoff. Yeah, of she it's like, it looks like Denai Guerrero is going to be uh, returning as Okoye, both in uh, Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever, which I think we kind of expected. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some sort of spinoff show. We don't know what it is. We don't know if it's the that Wakanda spinoff show that we learned about a few months ago that Ryan Coogler was a part of. We don't know mm -hmm. if it's that or if it's something else. Um, and we also don't know if it's a show that is a spinoff of Black Panther and it centers on Black Panther or somebody else, or if it's a spinoff just for her. Um, I could see them doing some sort of spinoff of just Okoye on Disney+. Plus. Um, I think that would be. I think that would be cool. I could, but they've shown they've shown some real love for the Dora Milaje as a whole. Uh, I mean, I think obviously focusing on Okoye, who is in limited, like maybe ten minutes of screen time total, um, has become one of the most imposing and like powerful figures in Marvel. I mean, she's just she, she, there's something about. I mean, she did the same thing with Michonne. Something about Denai Guerrero. I can't say her name. Denai Guerrero. Um, that. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you get, <laughs> I know, I don't care. It wasn't even close. I'm sorry, Deny. Um, you know, she, you can tell she's, she's got heart. She's a very sympathetic person, but she's also the don't fuck with me type. So, and she pulls that off well as, as the head of the door Milaje. So I could see that being almost like a, like a, um, inspection of what, who they are, what they do. Like, uh, you know, so every episode is a different that's, mission. That's they're the going Dora on. attitude all around. I mean, AO, who we saw in in Captain America and the Win uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier mm -hmm. had the same attitude. They all had that attitude. That is the Dora. Right, Marge. but she's the prototype for it. You can tell. I mean, yeah. may, not not in the universe, but the way she plays Okoye is how they modeled everybody else, and that's why she's the leader. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what this thing is going to be. I love Denai Guerrero. Mm -hmm. I like her in The Walking Dead. She's one of the main reasons why I kept watching. Uh, she's an amazing actress, super talented. She always has been. Uh, since the first, I first saw her in The Visitor all those years ago, I think that was 2007. Have you seen her in any dramatic roles? That's one thing, like like a true. I mean, truly... I, just, I, mean I just mentioned The Visitor. <laughs> oh, it was The Visitor one. That's why I didn't. I I hadn't seen that. Yeah, yeah The, no, the Visitor is an amazing movie. Um, you should go watch it someday. Um, it's a really great film. Richard Jenkins, mm -hmm. uh, fantastic. Um, uh, Mother of George, she's fantastic. She got a lot of acclaim for that. Um, she's a great actress, just all around, just fantastic. And she, I think uh, her Okoye is is amazing. I want I want to see more of her. She we got that little taste of her in the uh, in uh, Infinity War and Endgame. Mm -hmm. And I want to see where her character goes. Yeah, so, absolutely. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, and just just to zip through a couple of these last things, uh, one is is pretty important, but it's kind of too little, too late. And that's J.J. Abrams has come out to say, hey, if... J.J. Abrams is an idiot. If you're going to make Star Wars movies, you're going to start a trilogy, you should probably have a plan. Yeah, I don't have whole, he had no plan. I don't have the whole quote right here in front of me, but basically he got asked, um, I think it was by Collider, about the Star Wars trilogy that he was a part of. He did two of the movies for it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and asked about whether or not um, the way it was laid out... Um, whether they've been better to have some sort of plan. And he goes off on this whole thing about about the benefits of having a plan, and, you know, and blah, 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 blah. Basically saying Star Wars didn't have a plan. <laughs> didn't really have a plan. Um, and it would have been great to have a plan. And I was like, well, you were part of two of those movies. 
Dickhead, when did you have a plan? Um, yeah, you were the Kevin Feige. You started it back up. You had the most say of anybody in laying an outline for the three Kevin movies. Feige didn't have anything to do with it. But mm -hmm. Kevin Feige didn't have anything to do with that. I said was, he was the Kevin Feige. Oh, well, sort of. Uh, yeah, it's mostly Kev Kathleen Kennedy's the Kevin Feige in the Star Wars universe. But but the thing that, pro the, the, uh, what they were alluding to is, was did, did having Ryan Johnson come in and do The Last Jedi... <clears throat> The one good movie of that trilogy. Uh, no, I'm kidding. For the Force Awakens, it's good too. Um, to, to have him come in there and then do the Last Jedi kind of mess up the plan, and it, without saying so, that's basically what he's saying. Like, yeah, that messed the whole thing up. But it didn't have to be that way. They yeah. could have worked together and hammered out a story that would have worked for both. Yeah, but Ryan they, Johnson really doesn't seem like the kind of guy that, that's going to be like, I'm not listening. That. I don't put that 100% on J.J. Abrams because Ryan Johnson didn't do it either. Mm -hmm. But it's... Uh, Lucas and are a bunch of idiots for doing it that way to begin with. Why would you ever do a franchise, a trilogy, and then have two separate competing voices on it? it Especially when you're, you're part of the franchise that literally laid the groundwork for setting up larger scale stories. I mean... George Lucas had ideas for nine different movies when he first started. The first Star Wars, which was a low-budget movie they didn't think was ever going to get anywhere. He had a, a, a nine-picture idea going back, going forward. When you're dealing with something that's this big, this expensive, there's nothing stupid about making sure all the little details, making sure you know the motivations of all the characters, why things are the way they are, where you're planning to go, or at a minimum, have an outline for each movie that you're, you're thinking of doing. Yeah, it's just, I hate this hot, the hindsight bullshit. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, you should have had a plan. Well, you were there, and you didn't have a plan, yeah. so fuck off, J.J. Abrams. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm bitter about Star Wars still, about that last movie. I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm going to be that way for a long time. It's so bad. Yeah. Uh, it's it worse every time I look at any of it. Uh, so it's just, yeah, I can't do it. Uh, so, yeah, J.J. Abrams, you suck. Uh, anyway, what's what's our last? <laughs> I think we got one more. Yeah, we have uh, one last. Um, is, it, is it about? Is it about my my man? Is it about Matthias? Is it about my man? My my Matthias Schonertz Schonertz Matthias Schonertz. There you go. Yeah, uh, he was yeah. a backup Batman for Zack Snyder. Apparently, if uh, Ben Affleck didn't come through, oh, is that your man? Is that you're talking about? It's my man crush, man. He's been my man crush for like 10 years. You know, oh, yeah? I've been on the show for, for ages. I, I don't remember you saying that at any point. Oh, man. Yeah, you, you've probably forgotten at this point. Yeah. But I talk about him all the time, especially on the, in, like, on the site. I talk about him all the time. Uh, yeah, man. Matthias Schoenheim. Zack Snyder was, was talking about, because he can't not talk about. Oh, because he's in Rust and Bone. That's why you love him so much. I, I still to this day remember how much you love that damn movie. They did it. Huh? Rust and Bone, they did it, but he's been, he's been that ever since. So, mm. um... It's my man crush, Matthias, man. He should have been Batman. Fuck Ben Affleck. Uh, Zach, Zach Snyder, uh, like I said, he can't ever stop talking about superheroes even when he's talking about Army of the Dead. Uh, that's all he's getting interviewed for. So why are you talking about motherfucking Justice League, asshole? Mm -hmm. um, nah, he's not an asshole, but... Well, actually, he is an asshole, but whatever. That's a conversation for another day. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he told... He said that... If there was a time when Ben Affleck was kind of iffy on whether or not he was going to take the Batman role, and his and Snyder's backup, if he said no, was Matthias Schoenaerts. and who, like I said, was in Rust and Bone. He was in the Old Guard last year. Red Sparrow. He, yep. Red Sparrow. Um, Far from the Madding Crowd, which I think is this one of, another one of his great roles. Um, he was the backup idea, and I'm just like, I could have had Matthias Schoenaerts as Batman, and y'all ain't give it to me. <laughs> what? Fuck y'all. Well, who's this Robert Pattinson guy? Get him out of here. And put, put Matthias in there, man. What, what is this? How are you going to have that and put that out there? Yeah. And not not make it happen. Now, you got to at least bring him into the DCEU. I mean, I don't care. If he's not going to be Batman, you got to bring him in there to be somebody else. Let yeah. Him be fucking Booster Gold or somebody. But let him be somebody. Oh, please, finally bring Booster Gold to live action. Somebody will make a booster gold something someday. I'll tell you what, if you had, if Zack Snyder had stuck around, you'd have a better chance of seeing booster gold. Oh yeah, yeah. He would have he would have gone Snyder, deep. Because Zack Snyder is just thumbing his his thumbing through the DC encyclopedia of characters and just putting people in. 
Yeah. Would, would make sense for them. I mean, he'd be a perfect Ryan Reynolds character, I think, or somebody like that, like a Ryan Reynolds type, you know, the smart aleck, looks like a movie star type, but, um, yeah. Um, I'm would actually... Be, would be a good booster gold right now. Not Ryan Reynolds. I think Jeremy Renner might be able to do it. Um, yeah, he's a little too serious. Fuck yeah, man. He could not play Booster Gold. Uh, Who's somebody really funny, really kind of silly, kind of full of himself? Who could play Booster Gold? I'd have to, I'd have to, like, I'm so bad. It's like when people ask, what's your favorite movie of all time? Like, I just, my mind goes blank. Um, let's see. Like, ten years ago, I would have said Ryan, Ryan Gosling or somebody, maybe. Yeah, but he's, he doesn't seem to be able to handle that, the goofiness of it either. Have you not seen the nice guys? You, you, you know who would be, yeah, yeah, fair enough, but you know who would have been really good as Booster Gold? Pre-Captain America, Chris Evans would have been really good. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. That might, have been, that might have been a good choice, actually. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to really think about it. We sh- we need to do that at some point. We need to to cre- to cast our DC extended universe and and Marvel third tier to see to see who we can get out there. But I can never do these things like right off the right off my top of my head. Yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm usually pretty bad at these things. Other people who do these um, casting calls are so much better at it than I do. Than yeah. I they always come up with stuff. I'm like, yeah, that would be kind of cool, and I always forget about people. So I, I just immediately forget everybody that's ever acted in a movie ever of all time. Here's just the thing. And, and my general rule is, if you're doing a casting call and you can't think of somebody who who should fill a role, probably Matthias Schoenaerts is probably a good choice, and you should probably just put him in there uh, because there's nothing he can't play. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, next week, I, I'm actually looking forward to. I know we don't usually cover shows but i i'm i'm looking forward to seeing sweet tooth and i, I do want to talk about that a little bit next week um we have a review of that coming up soon too if if Khalil finishes it what else what time. else do we have coming out next week um next week is the conjuring the Ooh, devil yeah made the devil made me do it is the big movie for next week so i'm curious to see how that's going to do because that will be in in theaters um uh same day that it's on hbo max mm-hmm. um it. Yeah, that's that's pretty much all there is next week. So next um, week's pretty quiet. Yeah, it's pretty quiet. So I'm I'm actually happy about that. So yeah, and then uh, the next big thing is in, into the heights, which we've already put a revo- review up of, right? Yep. Review so in the heights, you can check that review up um, right there on the site that just came up. HTTPS. Why, why am I reading that part? www.punchdrunkcritics.com is the site. Check it out every day for all this news that we're talking about, all the reviews, all the good stuff. Right there, www.punchdrunkcritics.com. On Twitter, the site is at PDC Movies. Travis is at Punchy Critic, and I am at Punch Drunk John. Uh, if you are on Twitch, well, if you're not, sign up. And then if you are on Twitch, make sure you follow Travis's account at cinematic underscore enforcer. Uh, any tips, questions, comments, just want to tell me how silly I looked on this week's episode, email us info at punchdrunkcritics.com. We are always looking forward to hearing from you guys. Um, and that's all until next week. So until then, I'm John. If you like what we're Travis, laying down, we're out of here. Please subscribe Wait to up. our channel and click the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest stuff.